Before we um, jump to questions, I just want to um, make one remark, and maybe you guys have something to say about this. So the way I heard these three talks were um, Sam was really stressing some of the interesting regularities we see in cognitive science and, um, and discussing um, possible common mechanisms underlying these, but without necessarily going to the microscopic to do it. Okay, so that's something I want to come back to at some point. And then we have Josh talking about how decomposable systems are. And I think the decomposability question could be asked both at the, at the macroscopic level, how, how decomposable is the output itself, or at the sub-circuit level. Are there elements, uh, um, couplings, or triadic interactions in networks that are not decomposable to, pair, to pairwise interactions? And then uh, Melanie, uh, really stressing this, um, the, the role in these systems of the ability to read or respond to the macroscopic or um, the output, and how that influences the system dynamics. And so these three things are related, actually, I think. And uh, certainly, Josh's and Melanie's, in some sense, impact, uh, are they're going to impact the regularities that we see that, that Sam was discussing. And so my first question for you guys is whether, if you want to make some remark about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, that kind of dovetails. I also wanted to ask a question, but it kind of dovetails nicely with that, which is, um, so uh, this this question of decomposability, right, also gets us this question of what counts as the self, yeah. right, and how do we decompose an, a system into saying what are the individuals in the system? And actually, so my, my question for you, Melanie, is it seems like, you know, for example, me being self-aware, well, I can kind of think of that as some of my neurons are actually just aware of their environment, and my hand happens to be part of their environment, and we tell ourselves this fiction that, like, my hand is part of myself, right? But from my brain's perspective, it's just part of its environment. Um, and so I guess there's a question of, do, do you think that there is some intrinsic notion of individual where, like, we can actually say objectively yes, sort of, at some scale, this thing is an individual, and then you can apply your definition of self-awareness to it, or is it all just sort of where we draw the boundaries around the, the system? Yeah, I, that's a hard question. Um, I think there's, you know, we, we, have, we have our, what we think of as our self-awareness, but there's a lot of things going on that are extremely important to us that are not, we're not aware of at all, like our immune system except maybe when we get sick, uh, but which maybe you could argue has its own self-awareness that is just not part of the brain consciousness. Uh, I, I don't know the answer, but um, I, you know, I, I, I think there's in, individual, you know, self, we always, it's, we think of it as, as a, you know, all or nothing uh, concept, but I really do think it is shades of gray that there are sort of more unified selves and less unified selves in these complex systems. And I think it's interesting to try and differentiate that. I mean, if you consider the fact that we're made of 30, 30 trillion self cells and 38 trillion, whatever it is, bacterium. We call them self cells, but I mean, we're really quite a complex entity, not necessarily an individual in the traditional sense. Yeah, I mean, just to reinforce that point, we, we have the phenomenology that we have a unified self, but um, there's lots of ways in which that get, gets broken down. So, for example, when people think intertemporally, there's evidence to suggest that it, in some sense we think about our future selves as different people than our current selves. And in fact, even, uh, even if we think about a... Well, let me just give you one example of this. So you can get people to empathize with their future selves by, for example, showing them aged versions of themselves and actually increase their savings behavior and their health-related behavior in, in that way. Um, so, so, so the the idea is that sort of that is really like it, it. In some sense, the the same machinery that we're invoking for interpersonal decision making is invoked for intrapersonal decision making. I mean, that's an old idea in economics as well. Um, but even if you take a person to a single instant in time, there are lots of fascinating examples of where we even though we feel like we know ourselves, we don't really know ourselves. Um, and that, in fact, we're constantly inferring things about ourselves from our own behavior, even though you'd think that if it was really this, uh, if we're talking about, um, and I think this maybe connects to some of these you know, upward versus downward causation, because if it's really the self that's you know, downward causing all of these behaviors, 
um, then there, it doesn't make sense why th that that causal entity would have to make inferences about why it's doing thi the things that it's doing. Uh, but it would make sense if we think about the brain as basically a fragmented collection of uh, loosely interconnected entities um, uh, from which behavior emerges. And so, so just to give you a taste of the kinds of uh, experimental data that are relevant to this question, um, there's a classic paper in psychology called Telling More Than We Can Know, um, where the, these psychologists and these social psychologists in the 1970s, they would do experiments like the following. They'd set up a stand. Um, on, this was at the University of Michigan, and they, they'd lay out a bunch of uh, goods, like I think they were mittens and hats and stuff like that. And um, people would come by, and they and you could you could um, pick one of these objects. And uh, unbeknownst to the people making these choices, but but known to the experimenters, there's a slight preference for things on the right side of the table. Um, but of course, if you ask people why did they make the choice that they uh, that they did, they're not going to say, "Oh, well, because it was on the right side of the table." They'd say, "Oh, well, because it's this the 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 material in this mittens is very is a, it's a very nice texture or something like that." Um, but the experimenters knew that that was false, at least partly because they could take the same mitten and put it on the left side or the right side of the table and change people's preferences. And there are tons of examples like that. Yeah. So I, I think. Um, so you, and this has come up a number of times, this idea that self-awareness or some um, macroscopic property could be causal. And so in the downward causation work I did, I call it effective downward causation because um, all the work is actually being done by the components. And it comes back to the remark Melanie made in her um, 10 minutes when she said something like, um, um, so the, the system self-aware when, um, what is it? The, I can't read my own handwriting. Um, and the 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 the, the, the self-awareness comes from estimating the statistical regularities of the, by the components. So essentially, again, coming back to that core screening language, the components are doing doing this core screening, creating these statistical regularities, and they're doing it collectively, and then reading those, responding to those um, emergent patterns, and that that sort of like it looks like it's feeding back from the higher level to the lower level, but it's really the components doing the work. That said, I think that we can get a genuine new level of organization that's materially instantiated when that has spatial consequences for the organization. So I've been talking about the temporal consequences of having slow variables allowing this effective downward causation. But when that has implications for how um, the components spatially organize, then we can get aggregations like cells or, c or cities and so forth. And so it starts to take on a truly new level, I think, and have a more uh, a feeling of downward causation in, in the sense that um, was articulated earlier. So I want, want to ask, in your opinion, in living things, is there any computation that is not collective? In other words, it's, it's, um, it's a, let me make the question clearer. So what I, I think of as a collective computation is the computing entity consists of little parts, yeah. which have an internal algorithm, and they're talking to each other. And then what they do collectively has to do with, um, well, uh, how these rules ramify uh, when you make very large numbers of them. And um, uh, when, when we write computer programs, it's not like that. There's a human operator that writes them. Okay? But that's different. And I, my question is whether you think the second thing ever occurs in nature. The second thing being the agency? That's right. In other words, the second thing being a non-communal computer. That yeah. is to say one yeah, I, I agree. So to, to answer to that question, so the first thing, collective computation, the term was introduced by Hopfield and Tank and Hopfield mainly in the, in the 1980s in the context of AI and neural nets. And what always amazed me about this is that the collective aspect of, of AI and, and machine learning and neural nets and so forth has been entirely ignored. And it's, cause, and it's so strange because neural nets are so collective. Um, and uh, but, uh, but along those same lines, and all of biology, like you say, point out, you can think of it really, you can't get away from thinking of it as a collective computation, but there are some collective, so, some sentences in which it's trivial. That's the important point. And that comes back to some of Josh's work and these issues around higher interactions and or higher, um, whether you measure them using information theoretic measures or maximum and some at maximum entropy framework. And so the, one of the questions we've been interested in is coming up with ways for quantifying how collective a system is. 
So the question for me is not, is it or isn't it coll collective, but what's the sophistication of the interactions? And how does that affect the kinds of outputs you can get and the transitions that you can get between them? Um, now, in terms of your point about um, the agency and the fact that you have a human operator in, in physical computing systems, so this was Claire Horseman's point in that paper I mentioned at the end of my talk. Do phys what, you know, what does it take for a physical system to be um, computational? So in, in my work and in some of what Melanie said, the, the point is you have to have some agency, you have to have components that can make these readouts of global variables to, to call a biological system computational. Um, and I think that is actually also true for computer science. We just ignore or put outside the system the human operator. But it really needs to be considered in, in part in the compute CS theory, I think. Can I follow just with a mumble? Uh, this is, was also addressing your... Oh, fine. Uh, so I actually wanted to, to challenge a little bit of the hidden assumption behind your second thing, which is that the idea that when a human writes a computer program or whatever writes a computer program and the computer executes it, that that's not collective. I think that that's still collective, right? At the, if you go down a level, the computer is composed of, you know, are billions of transistors, each of which is doing their own little thing. And the computer program is something that sort of we use to communicate with the computer at a high level to organize its, its processes. But what's happening at the low level is still a collective phenomena. It's just, we are able to think about it in this higher level way. So I'm not, I'm not sure that even what happens in a computer counts as not collective. Okay. If I may have the floor again. There was a point I wanted to make about this, about your own computer, this one, that it, it, it really is collective, meaning not at the level of transistors, because of course they're directed by the codes, but rather there's more than one code in there. And these, these codes are little bits, we call them processes, and they, they're, they're in your computer memory, there's about 15 of them in there, a minimum, floating around, talking to each other. Uh, the writer of one of those codes does not know what the other one did, okay? They're completely logically independent entities. And they often do things talking to each other that the coders didn't anticipate. So even your laptop isn't, there's no master, there's no mastermind. That's, that was my point. That's a point I think is often confused uh, in the collective behavior literature. It doesn't have to be distributed. There can be, there can be, you know, essential nodes that do a lot of organization. It's just a different kind of collective behavior. Yeah, I know, but it turns out when you're actually building something, it turns out to have a central authority is really hard. And mm -hmm. in your own computer, the only central authority is the scheduler, and that in biology terms, simply means that you can have more than one set of proteins floating around at the same time. Okay. So we have Jeffrey and I know um, John Dale Connor. Check. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was intrigued by this extension of self-awareness into the domain of projecting into the future or thinking about the future um, fantasy about the future and reflecting on the past. And it seems to me that's very anthropocentric. And I'm wondering, because that's very different than the systems that um, Melanie talked about, uh, and maybe it's a question. Uh, does the collective self of an ant colony have any sense of future projection? I mean, it doesn't sit around like we do and have, uh, you know, discussions about this policy versus that policy. That's the whole point of having an emergent system. It doesn't do that. And, um, and it doesn't presumably also sit around and think about all the mistakes it made in the past. It just does. And uh, so I think there's something, and it's a question really, it seems to me there is a something essentially different about human systems than there is from these, um, you've only talked about biological systems. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about a city, it has a self. We talk about San Francisco or Baltimore. We talk about a university. And we think of it as an entity that has self-awareness, true self-awareness. It is of itself. Um, and so that's one end of the spectrum. The I mean, the other end of the spectrum uh, 
is um, I'm wondering, and it's related to this sense of what, what uh, computation is, but self-awareness, why isn't anything in the physical world self-aware? It seems to me from the way you talked about it, a mountain range is self-aware. It's reacting, it's computing of huge scales of time, but uh, physical things uh, that are uh, non-living, non-inanimate things could, from my reading of what you said, potentially be self-aware. So I wondered if you could sharpen that. So both ends of this right. spectrum. I mean, yeah, th these are all questions that uh, kind of uh, also apply to uh, well, your second question also applies to computation, right? Why isn't a mountain range computing? Yeah, so right. I purposely left that, but it's obviously related to that question. Yeah, what right. But um, so to the first question, do, do, does an ant colony sort of think about the future uh, collectively? Uh, so to some extent, yes. I mean, the, the ants f t take care of the, the, um, the offspring, they, they, they are, uh, you know, you could, could say, why do they, they sacrifice themselves to take care of the offspring, you know, and uh, that has some, some relation to the future. Um, they don't, I don't think they make the same kind of mental models that we do that can kind of predict, because they don't have the same kind of concepts that we well, have. They don't sit around and bullshit like we do, and yeah. we're very good at that. That's one of our great strengths. That's one of the things that presumably distinguishes us is doing what we're doing here. All the bullshit we've heard this morning does not take place in an ant colony. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I, I you know, see I mean, what you're saying. It's much more algorithmic. Right. Somehow. And I do think, I kind and of I'm agree with you. I that I'm just sort of pushing it yeah, to the extreme. I think that yeah. human c concepts are much richer and uh, we... That, you know, that's a discussion that could take a long time. But to answer the second question, sort of, why doesn't a mountain range have self-awareness? I I'm not sure that you know that the this, the way I defined self-awareness was as a global uh, a representation of the global state of the system, a dynamic representation that changes as the environment changes, but then has this kind of, as Jess would say, downward causality that impacts the um, really adaptive uh, functions of the components. But so the ranges do adapt. They're continually adapting. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean that's what geology is supposed to be about, presumably. Right? I mean, I think the, the, onus, it, the, the burden is on one to show that the components are reading off some aspect of global variables and using that information to tune their behavior. And to come back to your first point, Jeffrey, about self-awareness, I'd like to make this a little bit more concrete. And the way um, it's often thought about in the literature is um, in terms of being having the capacity to make a feed-forward model and having the capacity to run counterfactuals in that feed-forward model, so do perturbations to it. So I think when you put it in those terms, it becomes addressable in a lot of different types of systems. It's not like self-awareness seems untouchable in some sense. And so... Um, a feed-forward model, I mean, you can think about an organism, the phenotype, in some sense as a hypothesis about what the future will be like given what it's seen in the past. So in evolutionary time, it's a kind of feed-forward model. It's not maybe necessarily a very plastic one. Uh, and so then the next question you can ask in tipping points or critical behavior is another one. So like take a fish sh a sh a shoal, right? So you now, now a fish shoal sits near a critical point. A predator arrives and it switches states to schooling. And so it's got these two states that it, it moves between shoaling and schooling. And in some sense, it's had to have run a, some sort of feed-forward model, either in evolution or learning time, to, to, get, to get those two states. So this question of, of how you generate a repertoire of behavior is, is tied to this issue of, of running these kinds of models. Sam, I guess. Oh, I, uh, well, I actually have a question for Sam. So, you know, Jeffrey brings up a point where uh, and I think maybe Melanie already said this, but that there are sort of degrees of self-awareness, right? And maybe mountain ranges are very low on that score. But but you might imagine that when you're talking at least about animals or things that sort of are animal-like, that some of the scaling laws that Sam talked about are maybe at least signs of some aspect of self-awareness. And so actually the thing I wanted to ask you was, do you know how many of these scaling laws have have been replicated in some form in, in like other species and, and what other species. Um, but I think maybe you also had a... <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I had one uh, one response to, to Jeffrey's point, and I mean, maybe just quickly in response to this, m many of these scaling laws have been observed in other species. Um, for example, uh, and probably Chuck can speak to this more directly, but, but for example, um, uh, in the, if you look in the fly retina, uh, or, or fly, fly light sensitive neurons, you're going to get, um, you get, you get um, sensitivity to, to light levels that um, follow the same kinds of transduction functions that you'd see in, in human light responses. Um, but, but I think I also just wanted to, to point out that perspection and retrospection is not a uniquely uh, human capacity. So for example, there are cells uh, in the hippocampus that um, some of you may know about called place cells. So these are cells that when an animal is in a particular location in an enclosure, um, a cell will, will selectively fire um, that for that particular location. Um, now, critically, the animal can also be at asleep or um, uh, quiet wakefulness, uh, like it's just stopped and, and eating or thinking, and then those cells get reactivated um, when the animal is not actually occupying the corresponding physical location, uh, and it gets reactivated in, in one of two different ways. Um, so an animal could be at a choice point, and then what you see is that the place cells sweep ahead of the animal. Um, so, th so there's a phenomenon in animal behavior called. In, in r this is mo we're mostly talking about rats and mice right now. So, th so a, a rat gets to a choice point in a maze and it looks left and it looks right. And when it looks left, the place cells sweep ahead of it left. And the, when the uh, as, and when it looks right, the place cells sweep ahead of it uh, to the right. Um, so that's a that's a form of prospection at the level of the neural code. But also there's um, replay of things that happened in the past. So the animal will, if the, there, there, there are studies showing, for example, that when an animal runs along a linear maze and gets to the end and gets the food and then and sitting there eating the food, the, the sequence of place cells corresponding to that, um, to the linear, to the positions in the li linear maze replay backwards while it's um, eating. And, and then these have causal consequences uh, in terms of, for the, in the first case, for what the animal actually does, so f something like planning, and in the second case, the animal's ability to consolidate it, its knowledge. Um, and that's just one other thing that I wanted to p point out, uh, going back to this. So I just wanted to highlight something that, that both um, Melanie and, and Jessica were, were talking about, which is, you know, wh what, um, what makes something, what what is different about what is the difference between having information that's predictive of the future? So, like in lots of physical systems, if I make a measurement of the physical system, I can predict something about the about the physical the state of the physical system in the future. And we wouldn't say that th that system has some kind of self awareness about its future position, even though at, at an, uh, information theoretically there's information about its future in its current state. But we would say we we would be more inclined to attribute self-awareness if there was a model. In, in other words, that if the, the system had a representation of its future that was causally responsible for its future behavior, right? Uh, and so you could imagine, the, the, the one example, I'm not an expert on, on collective behavior, so maybe Jessica knows better examples, but like I was thinking, for example, of um, the bees waggle dances when they're trying to, when they find some uh, uh, patch and they want to tell the other bees about where, the, um, where that patch is, and uh, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but th that that um, um, the bees are are basically symbolically representing the location of that patch to other bees, and um, and then the the bees collectively make a decision about where where to go, right? So I, I don't know if that would would that satisfy the definition. And also, I mean, you don't even need a really complicated collective system like the signals I mentioned in my talk. The animals learn from their fight history. Who's um, going to win? They learn that asymmetry, they have a signal that, that stands for that. They use that signal to, to communicate to each other about what they're going to do in the future. Right? And so it's like the waggle dance, but not even as sophisticated. I think we have a question from John, and then I think we have to wrap up. Well, <coughs> uh, we've moved on, from, I guess, from self and, and the flip side, of, flip side of that collectiveness. Uh, separate questions, but not really. What's self is what's not collective. What's collective is what is what's not self. What is collective is what's not self. So when we arbitrarily construct the concept of self, then that creates our our concept of collective, right? Um, I'm I'm interested in the idea of self-awareness in AI systems. 
And understanding that as a way we could use to make AI systems more powerful and potentially to limit them, uh, self-awareness is pr probably a necessary, if not su uh, sufficient step to self-interest. And even people who aren't writing AI, some people are concerned about AI slipping the leash and becoming a little too self-interested. Would it be protective if we build AI without self-awareness? So we, we, we have built lots of AI without self-awareness. If we enforce it, I should say. Yeah, and, and often it fails it, it be precisely because of its lack of self-awareness. So one question is, can we build robust AI without self-awareness? Uh, that's an empirical question. I think probably not. So if we can't build robust, if, if we have to put in some sense of self-awareness in these systems, does that necessarily mean that they will be self-interested and have their own goals that may differ from our goals? You know, I, that, that's another really good question that I don't know the answer to. I think nobody knows that. Um, right now, we're pretty, f seems to me we're pretty far away from that. You know, there, there's a lot of people in AI who are talking about this, like we have to align the goals, AI's goals with our goals, but right now AI doesn't have any notion of a goal or e any kind of concepts like that, human-like concepts like that whatsoever. So it's a really important question to say, like, what is, what is the ramification of having self-awareness and not having self-awareness? So I think that's a really important question that I don't have a good answer to.